who are probably hungry. <laughs> okay. If you have a question, please raise your hand and Bruce and I will come by so that your question can be heard. Hi, my name is Sue Freeman. I'm from Pennsylvania, near Harrisburg. Uh, my husband has PSP. I think he's in his late stages, but in the earlier stages, he's been getting headaches, and he's still getting headaches. Would that be cause of all this, or what? Is that a question for me? Is this working? Can you hear me? Yes? Um, well, first of all, um, I think in a gathering like this, we have to be careful not to ask questions that pertain to medical, specific and medical advice just for one person. Um, so I'll just respond to that by saying that headaches should, persistent headaches always need to be evaluated by a doctor. Sometimes uh, PSP can cause headaches in the back of the head because of the muscles of the neck are constantly contracted. Um, but, so, but even if the pain is in the back of the head, and might be explainable by that, still uh, should be evaluated by a doctor. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Mank, and my husband is in the later stages of, we think, PSP, and that's my question. Um, is there any relationship between PSP and MSA, and could you have symptoms of both? Um, well, the PSP and MSA can look very much alike, especially the Parkinsonian form of MSA. Um, at the level of the microscope, they're completely different. Uh, genetically, as far as we know, they're completely different. Uh, now, can you have both diseases at the same time? Uh, yeah, a certain percentage just by coincidence would have both at the same time. Uh, but also, there is a certain very basic overlap among all of the neurodegenerative diseases. There's something that they all have in common that we don't know about yet. Uh, and so you do see the uh, multiple of these diseases occurring together in the same person, and I'm talking autopsy confirmed, more often than pure chance would suggest. Uh, this is uh, Everett Cook here from New York. A uh, question about the accuracy of diagnosis of PSP, CBD, MSA, uh, one of those three relative to what is found in autopsies. I understand it, it's difficult to distinguish bet between CBD and P PSP until autopsy, but if there, to what extent are, are, uh, are the conditions or is, is the disease just totally misdiagnosed and missed? Uh, uh, and it's something else altogether. Uh, well, if you're asking, um, you mean the ch chance that somebody who has been diagnosed as either PSP or CBD, what's the chance that it might be none of those? Well, uh, MSA can sometimes look a lot like PSP, but generally MSA and, and PSP are very symmetric. but They affect both sides of the body equally. CBD, the hallmark of CBD is that it's very asymmetric. Um, now, having said that, sometimes PSP can be asymmetric with regard to dystonia and apraxia, which are two movement problems. But um, there's a certain number of people with, any neuro, with what looks like any kind of neurodegenerative disease, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and PSP, CBD, and MSA, who turn out just to have a lot of little strokes little tiny strokes that might be related to hypertension or diabetes or just hereditary hardening of the arteries. And if the strokes are sufficiently numerous and in the wrong places, they can mimic any of those diseases. That's a very common situation. I think you actually hit a little bit on that um, on my question. It's really two parts. 
One is about the similarity and differences between PSP and CBD, and the other about the, uh, the applicability of the research in PSP on um, CBD. Well, uh, just to extend the um, description of the difference, the clinical differences, um, besides the asymmetry, uh, PSP is more of a midline disease. In other words, it's, it, there's a lot of problems with uh, balance and behavior. And CBD is more of a limb disease, more problems with stiffness and spasticity and dystonia, uh, apraxia, um, spatial skill, loss of spatial skills in the hands. Uh, so those are the clinical differences. Um, and there's differences at the microscopical level too. The, the tau tangles uh, have different appearances and occur in a slightly different set of brain cells in the two diseases. Uh, and as far as the research goes, um, the research that's being done at the level of the genetics and the other molecules, whatever's applicable to PSP is equally applicable to CBD at this point. We don't know enough about either of the two diseases to, to be able to refine it better than that. Uh, my name is uh, Pete Riga, and uh, my wife has lost her speech completely. And uh, a nose and throat doctor had uh, one time recommended that she take injections of uh, Botox on both sides of her uh, vocal cord muscles. Now, she also has problems uh, choking sometimes on fluids or even just her own saliva. Would this be a dangerous thing for her to do to try to recover some of her speech to have these Botox injections. Usually, is this, you can hear me, usually when, when patients come into our clinic and they have, it's come to the point where they've lost the ability to speak, our physicians don't usually go the route of the Botox. They'll send them to the speech language therapist and we do something called augmentative training where we use different devices such as an iPad, an iPhone. Even on your iPhone, there are applications, something called Locabulary or Locabulary-like or Speak to It, where you can pre-program in things that you want to say and then you push with one button to do that. So there's all sorts of different devices. Insurances pay for these devices. They won't pay for the iPhone or the iPad, but different computerized systems and handheld devices that will speak for the person because there is a real fear with using that Botox that you will disable some of the swallowing features and it will increase the risk for choking. My husband has um, PSP and he has a um, problem with choking on his phlegm and it's almost like when they have um, um, cystic fibrosis and I will hit him on the back to, and it will come out in strings. Is this a normal thing for the PSP? Again, in our clinic with our speech therapist, we work really as a team, so the three PT, OT, and speech. But yeah, people have a difficult time with thicker secretions, getting them down, so the phlegm and those kind of things do tend to pull more in the mouth. And one of the things you can get is a home suction device, where it has just a, a simple cannula or a tube that's hooked up to electric, and you can suction out those things there. So it's an easy thing. You would probably talk to an ear, nose, and throat doctor or a speech language pathologist. Hi, um, this is more for like a family member or caregiver. Um, I know that you had mentioned think before you move. Um, you know, my mom's completely cognitive in other areas except thinking before you move. Um, she's had hundreds of falls. And um, I didn't know if you had any advice for caregivers. I mean, because we constantly, repeatedly say, don't bend over, don't go backwards, don't do this, call us, wait for that. 
I know she gets frustrated. We get frustrated. And, you know, like, is there anything that we could do to trigger or cue her without making her crazy? <laughs> and with, Without driving yourselves crazy, yeah. too. Um, does she have is someone with her at all times? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, notes around the house. So first of all, the setup of the house, limiting things that she's going to trip on, you know, making sure surfaces are soft, that she's in the right type of chair to get up from, that she has easy access to go from point A to point B to where she wants to go to. A lot of times we'll use bright colored stop signs. Um, there are some things through the actual the Alzheimer's Association because a lot of people may not be able to remember things that they need, but they may be able to trigger a memory from a sign. So a stop sign printed up and put with someone. So different things. So instead of thinking more in, in terms of verbal telling, so actual things that she's going to see using different senses and things like that. The alarm mat can be helpful too. Um, some people just get, get conditioned to as soon as they hear that beep, they know they have to sit down. So actually practicing with someone. Now when you hear the beep, you sit. When you hear the beep, you sit, those kinds of things. Um, there are some patients who, no matter what we do, will get up and are very impulsive. And in that kind of situation, really, we would recommend a home health aide to take some burden off of, off of the family member because you really do need that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Anything you can think of? Um, I was just thinking the same thing, the importance of visual cues in the home, you know, uh, the stop signs. And even just getting, like, bright-colored Xerox paper like from like Staples or something, and then printing one or two words that mean something to her, just to, and put and feel free, like put them wherever you feel you need them in the house, as long as you don't mind them being there. It's a good reminder for your mom. And then, like Heather was saying, having somebody come in, and and then that way your dad can run out and take care of some things if you needed to take care of some errands. And it's a good way to rejuvenate for you too, because you're always a better caregiver when you have time yourself to kind of relax and do some things that you need to do. You can come back an even stronger, better, more relaxed caregiver. The other thing is to make sure that whatever, certain people have certain needs. So if she needs to go to, the, if she's getting up to go to the bathroom, maybe getting her on a toileting schedule so that every half hour you're taking her so she doesn't feel the need, keeping snacks nearby. So whatever she thinks it is that she needs at that time that's so important is readily available right there. It may decrease her chances of wanting to go and get it herself. A, a twofold question. Um, uh, the, is, is the visual up and down an inability uh, specifically for PSP patients? Uh, the one that uh, an, an, a neuro-ophthalmologist uh, um, diagnosis? Um, I'm, because I'm, I'm telling everybody that that's the way you tell that a person has PSP because of the eye movement up and down, or is it common to other uh, uh, diseases? It's uh, the, the up and down difficulty in moving the eyes is uh, not quite as common, but it's still pretty common in multiple system atrophy and corticobasal, and also in dementia with Lewy bodies, and to a certain extent in Parkinson's disease as well, as well. and healthy elderly people have difficulty moving the eyes up. And very often PSP starts with difficulty moving the eyes up just because it's an easier thing to happen and then the, the downward difficulty starts only later and that's when the neurologist might start suspecting it's PSP. The other part of the question. Um, um, my wife complains mostly about uh, lethargy because she sleeps 10 hours at night, and then she sleeps during the day two hours. Is this uh, after breakfast, and she doesn't get up until 12 noon, then she's, she eats, and then she falls asleep again, and really this bothers her. Is this typical of PSP, and is there uh, something that one can do about it? Uh, well, now we're in the territory of specific medical advice again, but I... Uh, in PSP, there is a sleep disturbance. It could be too much or too little. The centers in the brain that control sleep do degenerate in PSP, and um, it, it is very common for there to be sleep disturbances, either too much or too little. Um, my husband has 
has been diagnosed with CBD. And I was just asking, and I know I think one of the major problems um, that he originally started with is dressing. And I think maybe anyone with the CBD has the same problem. And if there's any hints on, like he can't, he knows the front and the back of his shirt, he knows where the sleeves are, he knows where everything is, but he can't, he doesn't get the message to put his arms where they belong or pull the thing over. Are there any hints to, for people with this disease that they can, you know, that you can show? I mean, we've tried everything that we can think of. I, I don't want to be, you know, as I said, patient specific, but I would think it was a general, it's a general um, CBD problem. Um, so he's able to know front and back, you said, right? And it's just kind of feeding the arm through the hole is the problem? Oh, they just took your microphone away. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Um, okay, so a few things. This is the top and the bottom, but if it gets, if it gets twisted at all, gets turned around, I can okay. lay it out flat. And he, you just can't, you don't get that. Apparently right. You don't get the... If there's one thing, if you can just um, make note if he does better with a, something that's a button-up shirt versus a pullover? No? Okay. Um, I would say then, sometimes like Heather and I were just mentioning to this other family, just having a little bit of visuals on there, like maybe like a little something that says L for left, you know, right? Um, or just not, if, you know, letting him do as much as he can on his own, but cueing him, being present the whole time. That way, if he does get a little bit confused, you can help him kind of start out. And when, what I always tell people to do, no matter what the diagnosis, if one side is a little bit more difficult, then always dressing that side first. Always starting with the side that's more rigid, more stiff. Um, it may be that you just need to cue him as to where the armhole is. Um, and making sure that things are loose because anything on, on the tight fitted kind of side is going to be difficult. Um, when he dresses that side that's more difficult, making sure that he gets it all the way up on the shoulder and then feeding the arm through because otherwise he could get stuck and that's very disorienting for people. Also, keeping cues very simple, not too many words. Usually the more words we use, the more confusion that occurs. So as simple as you can make it, that's what I would try, okay? With regard to CBD, I'm just curious about the progression of the disease and the sequence of the symptoms. Specifically what I mean is, I think you referred that the majority of patients exhibit movement problems, balance problems, I think you said as much as 60%. Are there studies where you have seen the complete opposite, where the symptoms are cognitive only without physical symptoms? Uh, the 60% the figure I mentioned in my lecture was the fraction of people with PSP who present with falls as the first symptom. But the, your question um, is, uh, is a good one. There are variants of, P, of CBD that are mostly behavioral, yes. Does that normally progress then to include the physical as well, or uh, not? Yeah, yes, there will there will certainly be uh, a progression to include the motor things, and um, even people who have the pure pathological cortical basal degeneration, there's still a wide variation in the in terms of the order in which symptoms are acquired, and some people never develop s certain of the symptoms. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for just one more question. Hi, I just wanted to ask. Um, I saw the, for, as far as occupational therapy, the the, uh, the toilet that you showed. Um, we have that, but um, I want to give more independence to my mother, as far as like. You know, because the rigidity and us sitting her down and stuff like that um, is, what is the best toilet out there? Because if it's that, I want something better. I know, like, Cole, Cole makes this $40,000, $100,000 toilet that has the bidet built into it. And I've been doing my research trying to find something mm -hmm. that will let her be more independent in that area. But it's hard to find with the 14-inch you know, or the 16-inch height, 
because if we're using that plastic thing it that costs, costs like 170 or something like that, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really bad, you know? I want to get something better. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough thing. If you have the means and the money to, you know, spend on installing the best toilet, the highest height with, a, you know, all the bells and whistles and things, that's great. Um, having, but if you're going to have a, a, a freestanding toilet, making sure that your mom has bars installed on both sides because her ability to lower herself and get herself back up still will be a problem. Um, it is great that you want her to be independent, however, making sure that she's been formally assessed by a PT and making sure that she's able to get up and down safely. And to and from, are you guys, you're still there. Yeah. Um, has she seen a physical therapist recently or an OT twice a week? They're not working on transfers? Okay. She falls back, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can talk to you privately. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Great. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Trish, someone in the back had a question. Was there some, someone in the back there by the camera, by the video oh. camera, who had a question? Oh, should I do one? Ask. My name is uh, Sylvia Guido, and I have um, PSP, and I want to know why I am so sleepy. Is this part of PSP and tired? Oh, okay. I, I heard the question. <laughs> the, the question was, why are you so sleepy? Sleepy and tired. Well, PS, PSP can do that. We, we don't have an explanation for it. It's just one of the many symptoms PSP can do. But there are many other things that can cause sleepiness and fatigue besides PSP. So your doctor should take a look at you, and maybe it'll be necessary to get some blood tests or a physical evaluation or something. Don't just assume that just because a symptom can occur with PSP that that's necessarily the cause in, in your case. All right, we're going to have our lunch now, and uh, we're going to go till about 2 o'clock. Um, I would like to ask that our guests who are in wheelchairs or who need special assistance uh, be served first. And the lunch line is, it starts o over there. Uh, Elizabeth, is it they start over there in the back? Or... Okay. And then after the folks who are in wheelchairs and, and who need special assistance, then everybody else can, can get up and we'll, we'll go till about two o'clock. And then we'll return. Thank you.